Oh, am I excited about today's episode, everyone. Because you see, last week, Marvel announced that they were going to start making brand new Alien and Predator comics. This is big news, because Alien and Predator are two of the most iconic figures in the history of science fiction and horror, and knowing that one of the biggest comic book companies on the planet now has the rights to start making books about them, well, that's a huge development. And being a big horror fan myself, my mind is racing at what stories could be told, at what creators could get assigned to these books, or how these books could even possibly affect the upcoming movies. I am so excited to start talking about this, and I cannot wait to get... Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Anybody else hear that? Anybody else? What's that? What? Oh, oh, there it is. Okay. All right, everybody, everybody, make some room. Everybody step back. Step back, everybody. Need a lot of space on this one. Hold on, everybody. Here it comes. Here it comes. And there it is. Folks, the Alien and Predator franchise has been... Uh, kind of all over the place for a while now. By which I mean for like 80% of their history. They're the Simpsons of horror. So I know that normally whenever Marvel buys up a new property, there's always someone out there who's going to scream, Oh God, they're going to ruin it. But when it comes to Alien and Predator, yeah, I think we're good. I mean, let's be real. It could be an absolute train wreck and it would still be mid tier for the Alien and Predator properties. However, Alien and Predator coming to Marvel raises several questions. Questions about Marvel's ever-increasing library of properties. Questions about what this could mean for the future of the franchise as a whole. And about a completely separate issue that I've been wanting to bring up about Marvel for a while now, and honestly, this is the best chance that I'm going to get to talk about. And before I go any further, I should go ahead and address this. Yes, I know that right now, there are way more serious issues going on in the world of comics, and those issues do deserve to be talked about. But I just got done doing a week-long charity event over on Twitch where we stream for 9 to 10 hours a day for 7 days straight to raise money for doctors combating COVID-19. So I kind of want to take a break from anything serious and just want to talk about something dumb. And you can't get much dumber than Alien vs Predator. Now, as I said, there's a few questions about this whole situation. The first of which being when we say that Marvel is going to be making Alien and Predator comics, what exactly does that mean? Are we going to get books set within the Alien and Predator universe? Or are we going to see the Xenomorph brought into the Marvel Universe? When this announcement was made, we got some artwork of the Predator holding up Iron Man's helmet and a Xenomorph on the Guardians of the Galaxy ship, but is that here to tease things to come, or is that more of a big welcome sign for these new properties? At the time of this recording, multiple people from Marvel have come forward to talk about this deal, and essentially all they've said is, we really like Alien and Predator, and that was about it. The closest we got to an answer was when David Finch, the artist behind these promo pieces, said he, quote, couldn't wait to see them wreaking havoc in the Marvel Universe. That certainly sounds like we're going to see a crossover, but then again, David Finch just drew these promo pieces. Odds are Marvel just told him, here, draw this, and didn't tell him anything else, and he just made an assumption from it. Now, if I'm being honest with you, the idea of the Predator and Xenomorph having a crossover with Marvel Comics sounds great to me. I love crossovers. I love big zany stupid mashups with characters and writers willing to just go nuts with these properties. Yeah, have the Xenomorph crossover with the X-Men. Have them fight the Brood and finally address that they're just a big ripoff of the aliens. Have a chestburster pop out of Wolverine and now we've got a Xenomorph with adamantium bones and claws. Put a Venom symbiote on the Predator and have him hunt down Black Panther. Go nuts! The bigger and dumber the better. When it comes to crossovers, I've always been in the pocket of Big Stupid. But when I say I wonder about what these properties coming to Marvel could mean, I'm not talking about mini-series crossovers like the series I've had with Superman and Batman and Judge Dredd and... Archie? Yeah, okay, sure. No, I'm talking about the regular ongoing series. Are they going to be set in their own universe, or are they going to pick these properties up and drop them into Marvel? And you might think, oh, they'd never do that. They would totally keep them separate because they're their own established properties, and they have too much of their own lore, and they're too violent. Yet yeah, literally all of that could also be said for Conan the Barbarian, and that guy is now on the Avengers. And I know someone might say, yeah, but Conan already had crossovers with Marvel back when they owned the titles back in the 70s and 80s. Yes, true, but again, they were just crossovers. 
He wasn't walking around in the exact same universe and living down the block from Spider-Man. But now he is firmly established as a Marvel Comics character. And this isn't the first time that Marvel took a property and merged it into their own world. Over the years, Marvel has owned the comic rights to Godzilla, Transformers, and many more. And almost each of these properties were set firmly in the Marvel Universe within these series. And I know that was a long time ago, but Marvel is a very interesting company. Every company out there is going to change and grow as time goes by and new talent is brought on. But when it comes to the business side of the company, Marvel seems to always hold on to the ideals of Stan Lee, which was to promote the crap out of your brand. Get it out there and get people talking about. It. And hey, a lot of the reasons for Marvel's success comes from this mentality. But it also often leads to some of Marvel's weirder decisions. I mean, I didn't want to talk about this, but Marvel is currently trying to sell Wednesday-only comic covers to try and start crap with DC for leaving Diamond, and... I'm sorry, what? That... You're... You're using this to try and promote books? Uh... Why? What on earth makes you think that this is a thing to promote? You know what? I'm not getting into that. My point is, Marvel will do what they feel will promote the books the most, and putting Alien and Predator in the Marvel Universe? Yeah, that lines up. Not saying it'll happen, I'm just saying brace yourselves in case it does. But if this doesn't happen, and the main Alien and Predator books are still set in their own continuity, which considering that Alien takes place in the future, sort of seems like the smart idea. Then again, Alien has like five different timelines and we're trying to ignore four of them, so real talk, if your problem with the idea of Aliens in the Marvel Universe is because the timelines don't match up, then yeah, you might just want to abandon that hill, man. It ain't worth dying on. But if the Alien and Predator series are within their own continuity, that leads me to my next question. How will this affect the movies? You see, the reason why Marvel now has the right to make Alien and Predator comics is because Disney bought Fox, so Disney now owns the rights to the movies, meaning they took the comic rights away from Dark Horse. Just like why Marvel is making Star Wars books again is because after Disney bought the rights to Star Wars, they took the comic rights away also from Dark Horse. Holy crap, poor Dark Horse. Well, at least they still have the Buffy comics. What? Why is everyone awkwardly walking towards the exit right now? And while there have been Star Wars comics for decades now, none of them were canon. They all existed in a continuity outside of the movies. However, because the new Marvel comics are owned by the same people making the movies, it means that something really unique is happening right now. It means the comics actually are in continuity. And while I know a lot of people will disagree with me because I'm talking about Star Wars on the internet, so of course they will, I honestly think that for the most part, this has led to some great developments. Through these comics, we've gotten some huge moments that were absent from the film, such as the moment when Darth Vader found out that Luke Skywalker was his son, or we've gotten introduced to new characters such as Dr. Aphra, one of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars, who will pretty soon actually be appearing in a live-action Star Wars property. Point is, these additions have mostly worked out, and it's actually been a very smart idea that when you have a world as huge and detailed as Star Wars is, to use the comics to help fill in the gaps. But what about Alien and Predator? If you just go by the movies, then these worlds aren't that big. As I said, the films themselves can't even keep the storyline straight. However, when it comes to the comics, yeah, there used to be a pretty deep lore there. Eventually, Dark Horse series kind of just became... meh. I mean, they still put out the occasional gem, but most of them just became, yeah, let's just have some more people get eaten. But when they started making these comics back in the late 80s, they actually had some continuity to them. And they actually got pretty fleshed out with some recurring characters and some complex lore behind these two franchises. So here's the question. If these upcoming comics are set in their own continuity, could this become the new continuity that they'll use in the films? I mean, let's be real, I'm an Alien and Predator fan, and I know a lot of Alien and Predator fans, and most of us would be totally cool with doing some kind of a soft reboot. Imagine this. 
Imagine they throw out everything outside of Alien, Aliens, and Predator. Complete fresh start. No Newt and Bishop and Hicks dying off camera. No Xenomorphs created by a robot with a god complex. No Predator Hunter Iron Man mech suit. Dear God, these movies got stupid. Everything outside from those three films are gone, and we get to rebuild everything from the ground up. And now, we get people like Al Ewing, Jason Aaron, Jonathan Hickman, Teeny Howard, Jerry Dugan, Kelly Thompson, Saladin Ahmed, Donny Cates, Matthew Rosenberg, and so many other insanely talented people working for Marvel to come together and construct something new while still pulling from the best ideas of the past continuities. Then, from this new groundwork, we could make films that pull from what works within this new continuity. This could be exactly what the Alien and Predator franchises needed. It's the fresh start with the limitless potential that these series have been asking for. But there is another concern that I have about this, and it leads me to what was the real point of today's video. A point I've been trying to make for a while now. You see, Marvel has done pretty well with their Star Wars comics because Star Wars is a franchise about space wizards made for kids, but with a level of depth and complexity that still makes it engaging for adults. It's right there in that sweet spot that a lot of science fiction and fantasy strives for in order to appeal to the widest audience. A sweet spot that both pleases the popcorn crowd, but also intrigues the thinking man's audience. And yes, saying those two terms did make me feel gross. Thank you for asking. And you know what also fits right into that sweet spot? Superheroes. They're a genre that is widely meant for children, but can have storylines that build up over the course of years with larger plot lines that many times serve as metaphors for real world issues that can be really entertaining and engaging for adults and older audiences. Both Star Wars and superheroes fall into that exact spot that appeals to everyone, so Marvel making Star Wars comics is a perfect match. But when it comes to Alien and Predator, well, yeah, they absolutely appeal to adults. They have the disturbing imagery, cyber organic horror visuals, deep issues about working class struggles and corporate greed, enough sexual and parental imagery and terminology to keep a therapist in business for years. But when it comes to how it appeals to kids, well, I mean, it has monsters in it and kids sure do love monsters. And there are certainly some kids out there who can totally deal with the more serious issues and imagery of these films. But would I say the intent of the films is to appeal to children? Yeah, I'm gonna say no. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. This is something I've brought up numerous times on this channel, but many comic companies out there try to diversify their house. They try to create separate labels that their books can fit under to appeal to different audiences. But Marvel has kind of put everything under one roof. It doesn't matter what the book is, it's going to be packaged together under the same banner. Now, I know a lot of people might not see why that's a problem, because they think, oh, the customer can totally tell the difference. They know that book A is different from book B. They don't need some label or banner to tell them differently. True, most readers out there don't need their books to be separated into different labels. Most readers can absolutely tell what the tone of the book is going to be and what the target audience of the book is going to be. But Marvel still has to make their books safe enough in case you can't. You look over at DC, who for decades had their Vertigo line that was specifically dedicated to books aimed at adults, and that gave their writers tons of freedom to explore issues they couldn't in regular DC books and approach them with a tone that you couldn't get in their other titles. And not long ago, they launched their Black Label line, which actually sort of directly canceled their Vertigo line, but Black Label was launched so that way they could tell the exact same tone of stories. They could continue telling the types of stories that were being told in the Vertigo line, just now with 90% of their titles dedicated to Batman. 
Okay, yes, I'll admit, I'm still a little bitter Vertigo got cancelled for this, but still, Black Label did come in here and say, we are making books that are only aimed at adults. And because it made the mission statement of this label clear, they can now get away with far more. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, but they can still do it, and that's the important thing. And Marvel used to do that as well. They had the Max line that was made to tell adult-themed stories within their universe and led to the creation or reimagining of some of their biggest characters, but eventually they realized, oh, if our titles aren't aimed at the largest audience that we can get, then they won't sell as much. So they canceled it. And now these days, the only time that Max Comics comes back is when Garth Ennis just suddenly decides he wants to make another Punisher book out of nowhere. Now, when it comes to many of these characters that were spotlighted in the Max comics, they've had pretty much no problem returning them to the regular Marvel Universe, even making some occasional exceptions to their censorship standards to allow for edgier subjects and language to make it through for a handful of their books. But they still have to stop short of approaching some of the themes or issues or tones that they dealt with under the Max line. And just to make it clear, I'm not one of these people who thinks that everything needs to be dark and gory and disturbing and bloody and loaded with swears. No, I'm not a 13 year old who just saw my first R rated film and is convinced that's the greatest thing that cinema is ever going to achieve. No, in fact, I think that most really dark and serious storylines can absolutely be told without any gore or violence or blood or cursing or graphic imagery. You don't need that stuff to tell really mature themed stories. But when it comes to Alien and Predator, get back! This stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus, just like me. Motherfucker. Alright, 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 they get the point. I don't know how many more times I can show these video clips before YouTube's robots demonetize this entire video. My point being, when it comes to Predator and Alien, the graphic mature R-rated stuff is something that is far harder to dance around. It's actually kind of a major element of the series. I mean, for crying out loud, when a xenomorph wants to reproduce, it does it by bursting out of someone's chest. That's like the most famous part of their biology. Well, I mean, that and the giant penis heads. To the one person out there who had no idea that's what the Xenomorph design was based on, my apologies for revealing that to you because you will never be able to not see it. Oh well. At least the facehuggers are just supposed to look like flowers from a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. Kind of a weird thing to base them on, but who am I to question H.R. Geiger? That was both a very smart and stupid joke at the same time. And I know that some people out there are going to say, hey, they can totally put these graphic scenes in a comic and keep it from getting its own label. Wolverine slices and stabs people all the time and he's still part of the main line of Marvel Comics. True, but with characters like Wolverine, their actions are different for two reasons. One being they tend to be more fluid and quick than what we get in Predator and Alien. A slash here, a slice there, it's part of a big, quick, crazy combat scene, so it's constantly moving and action-packed. They rarely stop to actually focus on the violence. But the other reason why it's different is graphic violence in Wolverine and other superhero titles tend to be part of a fantasy. You're there to picture yourself as the hero slicing into action. The tone is meant to be action heavy and even fun. But Alien and Predator are horror franchises. Horror franchises that dip their toe into action, sure, but horror nonetheless. The violence is meant to be more brutal, it's meant to be focused on, and above all else, it's meant to be disturbing. Yeah, that tone for violence is not going to go hand in hand with Marvel's other titles. The only book Marvel has right now that even gets close is Immortal Hulk, and while that book does really push some limits at times, even it doesn't quite hit the same mark as these series. And sure, you can mute it down for a crossover, but if these are going to be their own titles, they need to be under a new banner that will allow for these tones to be explored. But the real reason that we need to create a new banner for these books is because, well, 
it's not just Alien and Predator that fit into these more adult tones. Marvel has tons of characters who don't quite fit into the regular line of Marvel books and could have their stories and themes and not to repeat myself too much, but tones explored and fleshed out more if you put them under a more mature banner. Not to mention this would allow creators to have more freedom to tell stories with these characters that Marvel might have poo-pooed for fear of it not fitting in with their other titles. There could be a creator out there who has a really hard-hitting, groundbreaking, revolutionary story to tell with these characters and Marvel's going to tell them, yeah, we don't know if we want that story to exist in our regular universe, so it's going to be a no from us. But if you create a separate label and put those books under that, now suddenly these creators have the all clear. I mean, just look at DC's Black Label line. That's exactly what they've done over there. Mostly. DC still chickens out every now and again on some really interesting ideas so that way they can make room for more Batman stories, and it still wasn't worth canceling Vertigo for this, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit that yes, there has been some interesting stuff coming from Black Label that could only be told under Black Label. But as I said, Marvel tried this and then they said, yeah, you know what, not making enough money, shut it all down. Well, you know what would bring in some money? Alien and Predator comics. In fact, pick up Conan and move him over there too. Go to Donny Cage and say, you know that really good Venom series you're writing? How about writing a mini series for it under this new label? Blade has a new show or movie or whatever that's supposed to be coming up. Launch a title for him under this new label. The X-Men are big again. Anything with an X on it is selling incredibly well right now. Take a couple of your more extreme mutants and give them a title under this new label. If there was any time at all to launch a new line like this, it's right now. It doesn't have to tie into any continuity, doesn't have to connect to anything, it's a totally separate label. It's just here to show what exactly can be done with these characters when you embrace a new tone. What your creators can do when they're allowed to just go off and have complete freedom with a title. Marvel has needed to do something like this for a long time, and not only do they now have a collection of books that they're already printing that feel like they are just one step away from perfectly fitting in under this new label, but they're now getting the Predator and Alien franchises dropped right into their lap. This is the best chance that they will ever have to make this work. So yes, there you have it everyone. That was our episode of Comic Class today. Uh, I know that this was one half talking about comics, one half kind of talking about the movies, but I mean, hey, I like Alien, I like Predator. I kind of wanted to go off on these things. And yeah, as I said, this is a subject I've been wanting to talk about for a while. I've approached it a few times before in the past, but I do really think that Marvel needs to go back to having different labels, and I mostly just talked about a label for their mature raid books, but I also think they need to take all of their more kid-friendly titles and put them under a label, and I think that that would help to give them better exposure. In fact, it would also help them sell better, because then parents would know exactly which books to pick up for their kids, and also they would stop judging those titles against all their other titles. They would now judge those books just against the other titles underneath that label. It would really help to dive diversify all of their books, but, you know, uh, we can, who knows if it will ever happen, but we can hope. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed today's video. If you want to check out some other episodes of Comic Class from us, or, you know what, tell me what, I'll post up a review to one of the Alien or Predator films that we watched. That'll pop up here as well, because we also do movie reviews on this channel, everyone. Uh, and you can also follow me around the internet on Twitter, at Professor Thorgy, or you can follow me on Twitch, where, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we did just get done doing a week-long charity stream over there, so there's a lot of backlog stuff for you guys to watch. Uh, you can go twitch.tv slash Professor Thorgy. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.